Good evening to everyone out there. Thanks for joining us in Keys History and Discovery Center's virtual format and tuning in to our fourth live webinar. I'm Jill Miranda Baker. I'm the Executive Director here at Keys History and Discovery Center. And six feet away from me is Aaron Muir, Manager of Membership and Events and our new tech guru, producer of all things online right now. While we miss seeing everybody, we are so happy to have the ability and your interest to continue our lecture series almost as planned in this new medium. The museum does remain closed, but we do continue providing you with some distractions during this unprecedented time. We have added some content, including our Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m. when Brad goes live on Facebook and Mondays at 1 p.m. when Lake Terry from Moat Marine goes live. Uh, we have Field Trip Fridays at 10 a.m. offering a different historical point of interest and a history lesson. All of these are available on Facebook, but you don't need to be a Facebook member to uh, participate. Just go to Facebook or uh, just type in Keys, His, Florida Keys History and Discovery Center on Facebook and our page would appear. All of our offerings are also available on um, our YouTube channel. Let's see, next Wednesday, May 20th, is the second Cocktails with the Curator, an open Q&A session with Brad. These sessions will occur the first and third Wednesdays at 5 p.m. through Zoom. The program does have limited capacity, so advanced registration is required at keysdiscovery.com backslash virtual programs. On Wednesday, May 27th at 5 p.m., join us for Community Views. This is a new, pro, a new pro, uh, program that we're offering, and it is a narrated pictorial presentation sharing er, photos of early days in the Upper Keys community. The first area Brad will explore in this new series is Historic Tavernier. Tonight concludes our scheduled lecture series, but we are adding one for Wednesday, June 10th at 6 p.m. And the title is The Stock Island Site in Context, an intriguing Native American settlement near Ryan, near Key West with Ryan Harkey as our presenter. As we continue to offer programming virtually, please cons consider if you are able to lend your support for the continuation of our lectures and all of the new virtual programming that is helping us share our mission both here in our community and across the virtual world. Donations can be made at our website, keysdiscovery.com backslash support. We thank you in advance for your consideration. Now I'm gonna go into some go-to webinar housekeeping items. You should all see the go-to webinar viewer, which contains both the presentation slides and the webcam view. If you are on a computer, this is to the left of your screen. If you are viewing on an iPhone, you will need to swipe left and right to switch between the presentation and the presenter. On your computer, the control panel is located to the right. If your control panel collapses, the orange arrow allows you to expand it again. On a tablet or phone, the control features are at the top or top and bottom. If you have a technical question for Aaron or myself, you can type that into the questions panel during the presentation. But let's do a test run right now. Erin is going to ask you a question, so please reply to her with the number of people, including yourself, watching tonight. If you have a question for our speaker, um, we ask that you hold these until the question and answer session at the end. We will review the raise your hand feature at the start of the Q&A segment. If you experience a decrease in bandwidth during the lecture, you can choose to watch just the webcam view or just the slide presentation view. Audio continues either way. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Philip Gravenes, joined the Moat Marine Laboratory team in February 2017. Prior to that, he spent 13 plus years teaching, including six years in Florida's public school system and as an adjunct professor for Eastern Florida State College before returning to pursue his PhD in 2011. During his PhD program, he participated in a fellowship that partnered graduate students with educators to integrate parts of his dissertation research into thematic lessons for K through 12 students. He still teaches as an adjunct for St. Petersburg College. We are happy to welcome from Sarasota, Phil Gravenes. Welcome, Phil.
Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the invitation to um, present to you guys. Uh, sad that I can't be in the keys with you all, but uh, at least we still get to interact virtually. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about some of the some of the work that I have done um, during my dissertation, uh, but also during my postdoc at Moat Marine Lab. And it's going to focus on some of Florida's uh, most iconic crustacean species. Um, so I grew up outside of Philadelphia and I spent my summers uh, fishing and crabbing with my grandfather. And we mostly uh, caught blue crabs during that time, but that's kind of where I began my, my passion and for, for the marine sciences and, and for crustaceans. Um, that led to me pursuing my degrees at Florida Institute of Technology. And my research interests throughout my career have been trying to, uh, trying to determine how different environmental stressors may impact uh, the, the growth, the development, and behavior of crustaceans throughout their life cycle. And more recently, some of the work I've been focusing on has been looking at the effects of some stressors, um, environmental stressors on the Florida stone crab, the spiny lobster, and then more recently, um, the Caribbean king crab. Uh, tonight, I'm going to focus on just two of these stressors that I usually um, research. One of, uh, one of them is ocean acidification, um, and the other is increases in seawater temperature. Um, but my lab also does some work on ecotoxicology of red tide and then hypoxia, which is low oxygen. So the U.S. fisheries are an important part of our economy, and uh, they bring in about five billion dollars uh, a year to our to our economy. And a lot of times, people think about a fishery, and we think about fin fish like flounder or tuna. But <clears throat> um, a lot of people forget that 30% of that revenue is made up of lobsters, crabs, and shrimp, which represent our crustaceans. And if you um, Take a look at Florida's role in some of uh, the economy with seafood sales. We are ranked second. Um, we bring in about 17 billion. Um, and a lot of that comes from the crustaceans as well. So uh, this is from NOAA Fisheries website. And um, based on from 2014 to 2015, we've seen uh, a, about a 68% increase in the consumption of, of crustaceans. <clears throat> and we know that that's true, and we celebrate these iconic species with um, festivals and, and celebrations every year. Um, there's even a stone crab eating contest in the Keys that occurs every year. Um, and so it becomes part of our, our, so, uh, our social interactions and our culture as well, especially in South Florida. Um, so the stone crab, Manipi mercenaria, is my main species of focus. And as some of you probably are aware that the uh, Stone crabs are a unique fishery in that the claws are harvested. The animals then return back to the ocean. Um, and that's what you see on your dinner plate are, are the harvested claws from, from the stone crabs. In Florida, that ranges in about $30 million a year to the state um, and a, a, a big boon to local economies as well when you count in all of the recreational fishery as well as the uh, festivals associated with it. But the, animal, the stone crab commercial landings, though, have been um, in the press of, in recent years, uh, talking about shortages and where have all the where have all the Florida stone crabs gone? That was in the Miami Herald in 2017. Um, the Herald Tribune also picked this up and talked about the decline and, and, and the shortage of stone crab claws. But if you do a Google search, you can go back quite a ways and look and, and see that this, these shortages keep popping up. Um, and, and they tend to be in between years where um, you might have had a previous year that was a higher catch, then you see these continuous lower and lower um, harvests. And so this is the um, annual stone crab commercial landings. So these are going back to 1999 all the way up to last year. Um, and these are the total claws in millions of pounds. Um, and if you plot those out, yeah, you see this gradual decline over the last several years. Um, that equates to about a 30% decrease in the fishery uh, of claws that used to be there. So it's a loss of about 1.2 million pounds of claws in, in the fishery. And so when I was in grad school, one of the things I wanted to do was try to 
um, try to determine if there's some environmental stressors that might be uh, playing a role in, in this fishery. So one possible reason for the decline in catch um, can be attributed to fishing pressure. Um, we have seen about a hundred fold increase in traps since the 60s. I believe there's um, permits for about 1.4 million traps uh, in the state. Uh, and then you can see um, all the traps if you've ever driven down and in the keys uh, lining the sides of the roads. This plot um, is from the last stone crab stock assessment in 2011. And what I want you to get from this is mostly the fact that when you, th this ratio and, and how this ratio is calculated is, is a, a complicated model, but when, when these ratios are approaching um, one or over one, that's usually when fishery scientists uh, classify a stock as overfished. And based on the last stone crab stock assessment, um, we've had a, an overfished stone crab stock since uh, the late 1990s. So there's definitely fishing pressure playing a role. Um, but my, my lab is interested in if environmental stressors are, are kind of compounding that effect and preventing uh, the, the fishery from possibly being able to recover from some of that pressure. So another set of stressors can come in from changes in the way we use the land um, adjacent to the sea. So uh, stone crabs populations range from South America and throughout the Caribbean all the way up to the Carolinas. Um, and if you look at the U.S. Census Bureau of the Florida population, we have had exponential growth in our population. This goes back to 2015. <clears throat> um, and if you look at the main areas where Floridians like to settle are these red regions, which are right adjacent to the coastline. And so things that can happen associated with coastal settlement, you have more development, you can get more runoff, and you can get more nutrients uh, being pushed into some of your coastal areas, especially shallow areas where some of these stone crab fisheries exist. Um, and a report uh, by Zeng and Fisher in 2014 suggested that some of these areas in Florida's habitats can be changing in, uh, in their pH three times faster than what we project the pH to change for the end of the century. Um, <clears throat> so this is a plot of Florida Bay and, and the South Florida Keys. Um, and Florida Bay is centered, centered here between the southern tip of Florida and, and, the, and the Keys. Um, and if you could actually use the satellite imagery to get a, a proxy of how Florida Bay um, and the runoff that gets into Florida Bay could be contributing to some of the, the sub-regions of the Florida Keys. So um, this plot is going to show you chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is the, um, the photosynthetic pigment used um, by phytoplankton, which usually when you have a high amount of um, uh, phytoplankton present in the water, they need nutrients just like plants do to grow. And so that's a, usually an indicator of high nutrients. So high is going to be, high nutrient load is going to be in red and low nutrient load is going to be in, in blue. And you can superimpose that over this region. And you can see that Florida Bay definitely gets an input of nutrients, but those middle key areas tend to get the outflow from those regions. And as a result, you can get um, those significant reductions in pH that, that I had previously mentioned. Biscayne Bay also um, gets some, some uh, nutrient flow and um, some of my colleagues at NOAA have recently published some work on the impacts of that flow on uh, corals in Biscayne Bay. So scientists measure pH um, as a way to gauge how acidic the ocean is getting. Um, but I just wanna make sure everyone is aware. So the pH scale, we range on zero to 14, it's on a log scale. Um, so things like stomach acid and coffee are, are acidic. Uh, water is considered neutral. Seawater is actually basic and seawater is around 8.0. Um, strong bases are soaps and, and things like Drano. Uh, and so when we say the ocean's getting more acidic, we don't mean that the ocean is going to turn into something on the pH scale like stomach acid. We just mean that the ocean is going to move from where it's at right now towards that more neutral point. So we project by the end of the century, um, some of the open ocean areas are going to reach pHs, pH values of 7.6 to 7.7. So uh, back to the stone crab, uh, the life history of the stone crab is similar to other crustacean species where the males and the females come together and they, they mate over the winter time. The females will then uh, store the sperm and, and fertilize their eggs 
onto their abdomen um, when the temperatures begin to warm. <clears throat> so usually around this time of the year, um, May uh, through September is when they are reproductively active. Um, they brood their embryos for a period of time and then they release their larvae into the water column and the larvae are transported offshore to complete their development where they are free from uh, or where they can encounter less predators. Uh, okay, so let's see if this video works. This is a picture, a video of a stone crab releasing their eggs in the lab. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that. Um, so the female gets up on her, um, stands up as high as she can on her legs to elevate the abdomen and then uh, vigorously pumps her abdomen to help rupture the egg mass. And then all these little dots that you see in the water column here in the aquarium are uh, newly hatched stone crabs. And uh, if all goes well for them, two years later, they will uh, end up on someone's dinner plate. So we've been able to track uh, the effects of pH on a variety of crustacean species over the last several years. Um, and uh, we see that they, they, do, they are indeed sensitive to changes in pH. So um, spider crabs or king crabs that, that you might be familiar with from Deadliest Catch, um, they show increases in juvenile mortality by about 30%. Um, they also show decreases in their, their size of their carapace. Um, inshore subtidal crabs uh, and intertidal crabs, like this porcelain crab, they show decreases in survival by about 30% and they change their physiology, 37% uh, decrease in their, their heart rate, basically. Um, deep sea uh, king crab or deep sea spider crabs up in Norway, they show an uh, increase in their development time. It takes them about 20 to 50 days longer to complete their development. Uh, and then uh, commercial shrimp species in Japan, we have we've know that they can see almost a 50% decrease in their overall body size. Um, so when I was going through my dissertation, we, we did not see uh, anything um, looking at the effects of reduced pH on stone crabs. And so we decided to kind of tackle that question. So um, we looked to see what the effects of reduced pH were on their embryonic development. And so to do this, this was done uh, back when, uh, before Moat had their new, uh, new building. Um, so this was done in the old Moat facility. Uh, in Summerlin Key. And so we had two treatments. We had a reduced pH treatment, which was around 7.5. And then we had an ambient pH treatment, which was around 8.0. And as I mentioned before, the stone crabs will undergo embryonic development and you can track their embryonic development over several stages. Um, so newly extruded egg mass will look orange, but if you look under the microscope, um, you won't really see anything but that orange color. And as they develop different, uh, different morphological benchmarks show up. So for instance, the eye spot, which you see here, um, still a lot of yolk in the egg sac, which is that orange color, but the crabs at this stage are a rusty egg mass. And then when they're close to hatching, they turn to this olive green color. There's no yolk present under the microscope. The eye spot is very large. Um, and um, if this was a live image, you would actually see the, the embryo twitching inside there, uh, moving around. And so we can track the development time and we can track the stages of development. Um, by looking at the, uh, the development each day under the microscope. And that's what we did. Um, we took and compared the embryos from those crabs in those different treatments. And so here we have time on the x-axis uh, in days, and we have the embryo stage, um, seven being hatching is imminent, and one being newly extruded egg mass. And so here's the control in black. And so we see that uh, with, with uh, normal ambient pH conditions, it took about 10 days or so for the um, crabs to release their larvae. Under the reduced pH treatment though, we saw a longer development time, um, maybe about two to three days longer. And um, on average, it was about 24% slower for their embryonic development. So they were staying as embryos a little bit longer. Um, because I was tracking crabs, embryonic development time, throughout the course of their embryo development, I was also able to identify uh, when they were close to hatching. And with crustaceans, um, you can actually uh, take a subsample of the embryo when they're 24 hours from hatching and put them into the same treatment conditions that the female was in. And um, you can uh, wait for the female to release her eggs and then go back to that sample, subsample of embryos and see uh, what the ratio is of eggs that hatched versus unhatched. And so that's another um, measure of the potential effects uh, of pH on their, their success. And 
So here we have hatching success again in the control versus the reduced pH on the x-axis and the median hatching success in percentage on the y-axis. And crabs that were in the control, we had about 75 80% hatching success, which is typical of uh, most crustaceans. In the reduced pH treatment, though, uh, we saw a 28% reduction. Um, and so there were we still had crabs that did really well in this treatment, but we had a lot of crabs that um, just didn't, they, they, they became stressed, they didn't complete their embryonic development, and they um, failed to uh, rupture the embryos and release the, release the larvae. Um, and we published this work in 2018 in uh, the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. So the next step was to look to see, now that we know what the effect on their development and their hatching success, we wanted to see what um, uh, the impact might be on their larval development. Um, and we added in a second stressor, which was elevated temperature. And so stone crabs, after they release, I, I mentioned to you that they go offshore to complete their larval development. And they have five de developmental stages in larvae um, in their larval form. And it takes them about a month, depending on temperature, to complete that development before they reinvade to settlement habitats. So for this next component of the experiments that I conducted, I looked at the reduced pH and elevated temperature. And so here we have uh, four different treatments. So the normal pH or ambient or uh, ambient pH at 30 degrees, and 30 degrees is the summertime um, average temperature at the time of this study uh, in the Keys. That was the control. I had a reduced pH treatment. I had an elevated temperature treatment. And then I had a combined treatment where I had reduced pH as well as uh, elevated temperature. Um, and this was done with colleagues at NOAA in Miami, um, <coughs> uh, Dr. Ian Enox and uh, Dr. Derek Manzello. Uh, and so here are the course of the experiment in days, over the um, 30 days of the experiment. And on the y-axis is the, the carbon dioxide level in our treatments. The blue dots and our squares and triangles represent the um, ambient temperatures, 30 degrees. The red represent 32 degrees. Um, the green is going to be the, the, where we collected the crabs. Um, and then the triangles represent reduced pH and the squares represent ambient pH. So here's the ambient pH. Um, we had very similar levels to what we were catching the crabs, where we were catching the crabs. So we were replicating their field conditions um, fairly well. And then uh, the advantage of using um, NOAA's uh, ocean acidification system was that they were able to digitize it so that way we can gradually ramp up our conditions to our experimental set point. And so this is the reduced pH treatment. And so over the first five days or so, we were able to slowly increase um, the temperature and slowly decrease the pH. So that way we were minimizing the shock to the animals. So the first thing we looked at was the molt stage duration, which is the number of days that the, the larvae stay within each developmental stage. So here we have on the x-axis the larval stage and the five different stages, and the y-axis is the duration they spent in each stage in days. Uh, and so the first, oh, and the um, same color scheme, where the blue is the cooler temperatures and the red is the higher temperatures. And I'm not sure if you can see the polka dots, but the polka dots in this plot will represent uh, re reduced pH. So the uh, first larval stage, we saw right away that the um, elevated temperature was accelerating their molt stage duration um, by about a day. They were molting about one day faster. That change continued throughout the second and third and fourth larval stages. Actually, it, it became um, even faster as they went through their development. Uh, but then we saw in the last stage of development, um, Reduced pH kind of delayed slightly by about day, day and a half, delayed their molting into the post larvae. Um, and so that was an interesting result that we, that we did not expect. We also looked at their larval survival. And so um, since we are tracking individuals, we, can, we could also identify uh, what the probability of them surviving would be under these conditions. And so in this plot, the control is in black, the reduced pH is in blue, and then the elevated temperature treatments are going to be in red. So here we have days of the experiment versus the probability of survival. And in the um, control treatment, uh, we had about 50% survival to the post-larval stage. Um, the shaded region represents the 95% confidence intervals. We saw a reduction in survival in the reduced pH treatment. Um, and then we saw a drastic 
reduction uh, in survival uh, whenever temperature was elevated. Uh, and, and these were all significant from significantly different from the control. Um, we were able to run a survival analysis and we uh, were able to see that the animals in the reduced pH treatment were one and a half times more likely to die than animals in the control. Um, but the animals in the elevated temperature treatments, regardless of pH, were more than three times more likely to die. I think it was around 3.4 or 3.5 times more likely to die. So elevated temperature is really driving their development and also um, their tolerance uh, as far as um, uh, surviving to the next uh, life stage. The third thing that we looked at was uh, their behavior. So after larvae are released into the water column, um, the larvae are really good at sensing their environment and they have a, a, a series of responses that promote them being higher in the surface surface of the water column. So one response is they respond negatively to gravity. So a positive response to gravity would be that they would sink and, and go down towards the bottom. A negative response to gravity would mean that they would swim and be buoyant and be up at the surface. If you're a diver and you've ever you know, going down to 30 or 60 feet of depth, you feel that pressure on your ears. Stone crabs can feel, larvae can feel that same pressure. So whenever they uh, experience an increase in pressure, which would be going down in the water column, they respond it positively by swimming back up towards the surface. And they're also positively attracted to light. So that, these three cues suggest to us that, that the early developmental stages of stone crabs are gonna be positioned high in the surface, where currents can help facilitate them to be transported offshore where they can get away from predators and be in a more stable environment for finishing development. As they get older though, they get heavier, they sink, and they reverse their sign or their response to those same stressors. So we see uh, they're positively attracted to gravity, they, they um, don't respond to pressure increases, and they are negatively phototactic or don't respond to light which means that they're going to be closer to the bottom where bottom currents can then push them back into settlement sites where they'll molt into that first juvenile stage. So one of the quick ways that you can assess their swing behavior is by looking at that gravity response. And to do this, we took the larvae that we were rearing in the experimental treatments. We put them in a dark room. You gave them an acclimation time horizontally, and then you basically flip the chamber on them and watch over time what they do and you look to monitor their direction of swimming, so whether they went up or down, but also their swimming speed uh, from the video analysis. And so uh, this is the larval swimming direction. So here we have the control, elevated temperature, reduced pH, and combined treatment on the x-axis. And then this is the percentage of larvae swimming down. Uh, and so in the control and elevated temperature treatment, uh, we see about 80% of the larvae swam up, about 20% of them were swimming down, um, that's very similar to uh, previous published work for stone crabs. Under reduced pH treatment, though, we see a complete reversal. Um, the stone crabs here in these treatments were swimming down uh, and, and also moving faster. Um, so again, same treatments. This time we're looking at swimming speed in centimeters per second. So here we have uh, the individuals plotted here, the median swimming speed for the control and elevated temperature. Um, and each little dot represents the uh, individual responses that we monitored. But under reduced pH, again, they were swimming down faster. And this was significantly different than the control and elevated temperature. And if you, um, if you do some of the back of the envelope calculations, even though this, they were only moving down at about 0.5 centimeters per second, um, over the course of an hour, that, that's about 60 feet. So they can move at a pretty decent clip to um, swim in, in these vertical directions. Um, so we published this uh, last year in Biology Letters, and this has implications for stone crab transport. Um, so as I mentioned before, their, their, their preference is to swim upwards, get into the surface currents, and kind of surf their way offshore where they can complete their development. As they get older, they want to sink, get down closer to the bottom, and again, surf those currents back into nearshore settlement sites. Under ocean acidification conditions or reduced pH, though, something like this might be happening. And so in our, our conceptual model here, that would suggest that, that the, these early larval stages might not be able to get offshore and complete the development. They might become retained or closer to shore where there's more predators and also where the conditions fluctuate more frequently than they do in offshore conditions, which um, 
you know, larvae are uh, not as physiological, um, physiologically developed as the adults. And so sometimes the larvae are less tolerant to those fluctuating conditions. So stone crabs, the broader, the broader implications of this work um, suggest that you know, there might be a potential bottleneck event when we have these reduced pH conditions for, um, for the larvae. And that could potentially reduce larval supply and, and, and maybe impact the number of animals that recruit back into the fishery in future years. The delay in molting, um, it might not be biologically significant since it was only a day, day and a half uh, under reduced pH. However, anytime you're spending more time in the plankton as a planktonic organism, you're going to be um, increasing your chances of being preyed upon by other, other animals. Um, and so that could be detrimental to the supply as well. Uh, we saw lower survival under elevated temperature, but pH is easier to mitigate. So we can reduce the amount of runoff or nutrients or um, uh, limit kind of what gets into those coastal areas, but uh, temperature is going to be hard to change. And um, some of my colleagues at USGS have already shown that the Florida Keys have seen a 0.8 degree increase in temperature over the last 50 years. So uh, we, we, we think the temperature is going to continue to be an issue for this species. In, uh, and another compounding effect of that is if they are reducing the dispersal, that reduced dispersal under acidified conditions um, might limit their ability to migrate to cooler areas um, north and expand their range. Um, and so uh, those are some of the implications for this uh, component of the research focusing on, on stone crabs. I'm going to switch gears for the last 20% of my talk and, and uh, kind of go over some of the most recent work that I have been doing um, with colleagues at uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife and um, College of the Florida Keys, or uh, and we've been looking at the effects of reduced pH on spiny lobsters, which is another iconic fishery in, in South Florida. Uh, and the spiny lobster fishery, just like the stone crab fishery, is, is a big economic boon to our state. $500 million a year is estimated to come from the spiny lobster fishery. Um, and <clears throat> the spiny lobster uh, life cycle has similar components to the stone crab life cycle. Um, a, long, a longer pelagic or offshore development time than stone crabs, but, but the stages are, are kind of similar. And so the females will extrude their embryos and put them onto their um, abdomen. Uh, they then release them, and these hatch out as what a first stage larva looks like, uh, very alien looking. Uh, they spend nine months in the plankton. So stone crabs are about a month in the plankton, Spiny lobsters are nine months, and, and a lot of our spiny lobster populations are coming from other areas um, like Cuba. After nine months in the plankton, they then develop into post larvae. And the post larvae spiny lobsters look something like this. Um, they are clear, completely transparent. Um, it's very hard to see them in the water column. They have these very long um, antennules that they use to taste and sense their environment. Uh, and the, the work that we've been doing over the last year, year and a half, has been focused specifically on this post-larval stage. And that's because when the post-larvae start to, uh, they're riding the Gulf Stream and then they um, start to turn left and come back into the Florida Keys, um, they are uh, looking for chemical cues associated with red macroalgae that, that's in, our, in Florida Bay or in and around Florida Bay in our reefs, um, and that's called Laurentia. And that Laurentia gives off these, these chemical cues that the post larval spiny lobsters are trying to seek out. Um, the, there's been studies that show that Laurentia has uh, results in higher survivorship for the post larvae and it also provides food sources for them for after they molt into the first, lar uh, first juvenile stage. So we've been trying to determine if reduced pH can impact uh, post larval orientation to these, these Laurentia cues. So to do that, we collect these post-larval lobsters off of uh, um, from bridges uh, at nighttime around the, the moon, the, the, the lunar cycle, um, using a plankton net, and then we transport them back to Moat Marine Lab in Summerlin Key. And this particular experiment, we had two treatments: we had an ambient pH treatment, and we had a reduced pH treatment. 
um, ambient treatment was around 8.0 and the reduced treatment was around 7.6, 7.7, which is what we forecast to happen over the next 50 or so years. Um, the spondylopters are only at this stage for, uh, for about three or four days. So all the animals that we caught were conditioned in these treatments for three days before we use them um, in the experiments. Uh, and then we had a setup where we were basically giving them a choice in, a, in what we call a Y maze. And so we had seawater that had no Q present, so just filtered seawater. And then we had seawater with Lorentzia incubating inside, and that was stimulating a, a, a Q from the Lorentzia. We used pumps to pump that water at the same rate into a Y maze. And so we did this again at nighttime in a dark room to minimize and reduce any visual stimuli to the lobsters. And we took randomly, took those animals from our treatments, put them into the Y maze, turned on the pumps uh, after an acclimation period and monitored what the larvae did or what the post larvae did. Did they go towards those chemical cues or did they wander or did they stay neutral? Um, and so we monitored attraction, um, time, uh, time on the Q side of the chamber versus time on the uh, being inactive. So here is uh, some of the results. Um, this is attraction to the Lorentzia Q, the ambient pH larvae are in white, the reduced pH larvae are in black. And this is the proportion of animals that were attracted to the Q. Uh, and we see right away we had um, ambient larvae were seeking out the Lorentzia and over 80% of them moved toward the Lorentzia side of the chamber, um, significantly different from the reduced pH animals, condition, um, animals in the reduced pH, they uh, only about 15% of them or so, 10% of them or so moved towards the Lorentzia. We also looked at if they were potentially avoiding the Q. Uh, we saw a similar response with the reduced pH. There was about 12% of them reducing or uh, reducing their attraction or minimizing their attraction to the Q. Um, and then no attraction or, or avoidance behavior elicited. Uh, this was in the reduced pH treatment. We saw about 70% of them um, elicit no attraction or simply just avoided um, kind of like a neutral response. Whereas the uh, ambient larvae, um, we, did, we saw the opposite effect. We also looked at time on the Lorentzia side of the chamber. So this is in seconds on the y-axis and then the ambient pH and reduced pH on the x-axis. So the ambient pH, we had um, about 70 to 80, maybe 90 seconds on, on average, the animals um, moving um, or staying on the Lorentzia side of the chamber. Uh, some animals spent the entire time on the Lorentzia side of the chamber. Uh, but when under the reduced pH condition, uh, we saw very little animals spent their time on the Lorentzia side of the chamber. And this was also significantly different from the reduced pH treatment. We also looked at the time inactive. So the time that they spent in that first section of the, of the maze where we um, introduced the animal. Uh, and inactive was defined as basically the animal didn't move from where we put it. Um, so here we have time as 300 seconds. We have ambient pH, reduced pH again. And on average, the ambient animals um, spent about 90 seconds, 100 seconds as inactive. And we did have a couple that spent the whole time inactive. But when you compare that to the reduced uh, pH treatment, we had a significant difference again. The large majority of animals in the reduced condition, reduced pH condition treatment were, um, were spending less time uh, active. Um, so this could have implications for the spiny lobster fishery as well. Um, so one possibly one possible thing that might or factor that might be going on or mechanism that might be at play is that the the post larvae um, possibly may be have uh, experiencing damage to their to their receptors. Um, and if they are experiencing damage to those receptors and reduced pH, um, that might decrease their ability to sense the cue, or they might need a cue that's stronger than what, um, what we were exposing them to. If the lobsters are becoming inact inactive under reduced pH, then that again is going to be, um, make them susceptible to increased predation pressure uh, in those near shore habitats. Uh, and that could also uh, mean less recruitment coming into some of those near shore areas. Um, so this isn't this isn't for the whole keys. This is just for some of those habitats where you get these episodic changes in um, pH. Oops. Um, and so that is uh, 
the, the, the work I've been working on at Moat over the last several years. Um, and I would like just to thank uh, a lot of my collaborators. I couldn't have done this work without them. Um, my postdoc funding came from the Steinwachs Family Foundation. Um, I've also been working closely with Florida Fish and Wildlife, Florida Fish and Wildlife colleagues, um, my colleagues at the College of the Florida Keys and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and then um, a lot of my stone crab research has been supported by uh, NOAA and uh, University of Miami, um, as well as some um, uh, Protect Our Reef funding from uh, Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. And with that, um, I can, I think I have time for a handful of questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Phil, for that wonderful presentation. This is Aaron Muir, and I'm going to be moderating the question and answer segment this evening. Sure. All right. So if for our attendees tonight, if you would like to ask a question, you may use your raise hand button. And I will be able to see everyone who has a hand raised and will call on you to ask your question. When I call on you, I will unmute your microphone. When I do this, you should get a notification that says something along the lines of the organizer has unmuted you. Would you like to unmute? And you select yes. If you don't see this notification, you can always check your mute status by looking at your microphone button. If there is a slash line through it, you are muted, or if it's red. A microphone with no slash or green means your mic is on for everyone to hear. If someone else asks your question or you change your mind about asking your question, hit your raise hand button again and it will lower your virtual hand. Or you can always type in your question in the questions panel like we reviewed at the start of the webinar and I will read your question to Phil. All right, let's give this a shot. Let's go ahead and go to one of our questions that has been typed in. We have a question from Lou. And the question is, is Laurentia the primary cue for lobster larvae? For post larvae, uh, it is, they, they respond to a variety of cues, but it's, it's one of the main ones. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of work over the 80s and in the 80s and 90s had shown that they can, they can actually sense Laurentia cue from 30 or 40 kilometers off the reef. So it is one of their main cues. Okay, Good question. let's go ahead and let H Heidi start up, give it a shot asking a question. Heidi, you are unmuted, so go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. So I got two questions, a two-part question. One, how long does a stone crab live from the beginning till the end of its life? And then two, is it better to just take one claw because I heard you could take two claws, but most people only take one claw when they harvest it. Thanks, those are great questions. Um, so a stone crab, we think they live about six to eight years. Um, <clears throat> that's your first question. As far as the claw removal, um, you can take both claws at their legal limit, um, which is about you know two and three quarter inches from the elbow, the elbow to the what would be the tip of their claw. Um, we see though significant differences in mortality when you remove one versus both claws. Um, so if removing one claw, you have a 40% immortality on the animal. Removing both claws results in about 60% mortality. Um, and when they're in elevated temperature, that exacerbates that even further. Um, my colleagues at Florida Fish and Wildlife, Ryan Gandy and Claire Crowley published that work uh, a year or two ago. Um, so, so claw removal can indeed reduce their uh, their survivorship. Does that answer your question? Yes. Can I ask one last quick question? I think so. Yeah. When you said it, the the female re re releases larva, about how many eggs are in that larva? Or yeah, that's another great question. Um, depending on the size of the female, they'll have anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand eggs on their abdomen, um, but. Uh, the, the estimated survival is extremely low. Um, we estimate that 99% of them die. Uh, I think it's actually higher than that 0.5 or six zeros, one percent of them actually survive. Um, so it's that they get they're like the potato chips of the plankton. Everything wants to eat them. Okay, I just wanted to say I'm Heidi's husband, I'm not Heidi. 
<laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks for your question. All right, let's go ahead and go to a question from Beth Nichols. Beth, I unmuted you. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, please. I'm, I'm uh, Gary Nichols, and I have I fish pretty much uh, one and a half percent of the stone crab fishery with our family. About twelve thousand stone crab traps and uh, seven thousand lobster traps. So, and we've been in business since for about forty-seven years down here in the Keys. Um, and we have a real important. Uh, meeting tomorrow for all the fishermen and in, in, that are involved in the stone crab industry because uh, the FWC is doing a, a study tomorrow and we're doing a webinar also on stone crab so your your presentation was really good Phil I appreciate it very much and I got got some answers to some questions on I, I didn't know that the stone crabs took one one you know were one month in the uh, larval stage um, I, I guess the question that I have is you know, this, this, the thing that I've noticed as a fisherman is that, that we have had an increased, the, the one thing that I, that's universal over the 47 years I've been in business is that our water quality hasn't improved. And, and I've been involved in joint action groups for water quality and so on and so forth. And we ha after the hurricane, we had tremendous algae blooms. And our production of stone crabs really hasn't been, it's very fluctuative year to year. I mean, even with your stuff. What would you suggest that we do to increase the viability of our industry? Because, you know, being farmers of the sea, just like a farmer in a field, if you had something to suggest to every to everybody out there, I want to have this fishery for my children, my tourist children. So what would you say as a biologist and having studied this would be something that we would be able to uh, go forward as an industry? And I've been on the fisheries management end of things that can help us. Thanks. Uh, those are great questions. Um, so I think there's a few things that we can be better at. Um, <clears throat> I mean, restoring uh, some of the wetlands associated with the Everglades is our natural barrier to a lot of those nutrient loads coming into um, Florida Bay, uh, which eventually get flushed out into our, our coastal areas. Um, so that's definitely one thing that we could we could improve upon. Um, with the stone crab fishery, um, we're seeing warmer temperatures, uh, and those warmer temperatures are are on the bookends of the fishery. Um, so temperatures are staying warmer longer into October. You know, the start of the season is around October 15th, I believe, and then temperatures are staying um, warming up earlier. So May 15th is usually the mark of the start of the season. Um, so those those crabs are sensitive to that temperature. And whenever the temperature increases above 27 degrees, that's when they become reproductive. So if we shaved off a little bit of the um, on the back end of the fishery season, um, that might allow some of those earlier crabs to produce more embryos um, and produce more stock into the, the, the larval population. Um, another thing that I know my, my colleague Ryan Gandy at Fish and Wildlife is working on is trying to get um, some of the stone crab fishermen to um, adopt escape gaps in their traps. Right now, we don't have any as a as a regulation. Um, the blue crab fishery did this in the Chesapeake, um, all up and down the East Coast. They're they're basically gaps in the trap that allow the smaller bycatch to get out. And stone crab traps are really good at collecting stone crabs, even the small ones. Um, and so by by putting that that escape gap on the side of the trap, that will allow when you pull the trap up, all the small guys to flush out. Um, keeps the bigger biomass in the trap that you can harvest. Smaller guys get a chance to not become food for those larger crabs um, in, in the trap. Um, I think some of the fishermen that tested that also in, said that they enjoyed it because it, it, it reduced the time that they spent sorting because a lot of the small stuff just kind of sorted itself out by going through the, the trap, uh, the, gape, the, the gape in the trap. Um, and then another thing we can do is we know that those large crabs those, uh, those large and jumbo sized claws are not going to come back into the fishery after they have been harvested just because the mortality rate is so high. And we know that the, the, the predominant um, claw in the fish house right now uh, is the, the medium sized claws. That seems to be what most crabbers are catching as, as their bread and butter. Um, so if we increased the claw size slightly, uh, Fish and Wildlife has done some spawning potential models, which show that by increasing this, the claw size 
um, slightly, you have the potential to increase again that biomass of uh, that the female can produce. Those female crabs, they can release more eggs, get more larvae into the water column, um, and and um, hopefully that could be one way to help the, the population. Um, so yeah, those are several ways I think we can can make some adjustments to help help the fishery out and and keep uh, keep crabbers crabbing and but also keep the crabs there for uh, future generations. Thank you for your question. All right, and thank you, Gary and Beth, for participating with us tonight. I'm going to go to a question that has been typed in that's been sitting here for a few minutes um, from Brian Granger. How far offshore do the stone crab larvae travel? Uh, Brian, that is a fantastic question. Um, we don't 100% know. Um, it's something that we're working on right now. Um, we're I'm working with some colleagues at uh, Louisiana State University who are biophysical modelers who track particles in the ocean. And we're in the process of writing some proposals to uh, take some of my behavior work that I've been doing with larval swimming and incorporate that into a physical model where we can actually track and, and find well where they're coming from, where they're going, and that could help us to potentially look at some sites that maybe we want to protect some areas as a nursery ground because we know that the crabs are going to go there, or maybe we want to protect other areas that are large mating grounds because we know that's where a large pulse of crabs are coming from. Um, so yeah, that's one. That's one of the. That's one of the items on my list that uh, that we want to look at, um, but we we don't know how far offshore that that they go. Okay, and another question that has been typed in from Lou Toff, how strong is the gravitational effect underwater for stone crabs? Well, it's a the gravitational effect, um, that's more of a response, a, a buoyancy response. Um, so they will passively sink, uh, and it's a complicated, complicated process because you have um, three factors. You have light, you have pressure, and you have gravity. So they will be attracted to light, um, they will sink down, they'll feel that increase in pressure, which will trigger them to then be negatively geotactic and, and, and swim back up. Um, I'm not sure the magnitude of change that they might experience from more towards the surface, to mid-water mid to, to at depth, um, but it, all three of those cues kind of interact to trigger them to respond um, and swim up or down. Um, they have they have this organ. It's a calcium, a small calcium ball that's um, in their head that uh, acts very similar to a gyroscope, and that's how they sense these cues. Uh, and so one of the things we think is happening under reduced pH is that maybe that calcium ball is becoming de uh, degraded or broken down, and that might be why they they flip their orientation and get disoriented. Okay, we're going to go to Rick Johnson next. I see you've also typed in your question, so I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, Maine has a larger size limit than Florida. Does your research indicate a larger limit could help the overall population? I'm sorry, was that Maine? Yes. Maine, um, I'm not sure. Can, could you maybe clarify that? Because uh, Maine doesn't have stone crabs. Are you, Rick, are you maybe talking about the lobster? So let's see if um, Rick can type in a clarification for us sure. on that question. And then in the meantime, we'll okay. go to a question that has been typed in by Veronica, who wants to know what are some things that we can do to help the ocean acidification issue? Um, great question. Um, some of the, I mean, some of the things we can do is, um, it's, it's it's a it's a local issue and it's also a global issue. Um, so you know you can do things locally to help your environment. You know, and it sounds cliche to say these things, but you know, recycling, investing in um, renewable energies, carpooling, um, those things help reduce carbon emissions, which can um, uh, contribute to the long-term reduction in pH trend that that we're forecasting. Um, locally, some of the things we can do is um, reduce the amount of waste or nutrients that uh, that get into our waterway. So, you know, maybe don't fertilize your lawn during the rainy season, um, pick up after your pet. Um, those are ways that you can 
uh, minimize how much nitrogen and phosphorus get into the water. And those organic nutrients that we get from all, from land-based sources are, are also what drive the rapid changes in pH in some of the coastal areas, especially shallow water um, like Florida Bay. It's because those shallow habitats can change so quickly because they're, they're so shallow. There's less volume of water there. Okay, thank you. And so we have clarification from Rick on his question. He is okay. referring to lobster and uh, would a larger limit help the overall population? The short answer to that is yes. Um, any, any limit that we put on our, on our fisheries will uh, most likely help them moving forward. Um, I'm not familiar with the lobster fishery in Maine and what those limits are relative to, to ours, but um, but I mean, yes, yeah, sure, that, that's definitely something we can do. Just similar to how we I was discussing previously about increasing the claw size a little bit on the stone crab to let the crabs have more time to reproduce. Same idea with with limits on spiny lobsters. Um, you know, reducing that limit a little bit could mean more biomass in the ocean, more biomass in the ocean over time could mean more pop, more larvae in the pool to hopefully survive and get back to land or back to near shore areas. Okay, um, I've got one more typed question I'm gonna go to before I go back to a raised hand. Uh, Larry okay. Lloyd would like to know, what are the major predators of crab and lobster larvae? Um, anything in the plankton that has a mouth bigger than their spines, basically. Um, they're they're tiny. They're about the size of a sesame seed um, for the stone crabs when they hatch. Um, you can see them with the naked eye, like I showed you in the video, um, but a lot of things will eat them. That's why they've evolved over time to have those spines as a kind of a deterrent for other planktonic critters that might want to feed on them, like larval fish and worms and um, uh, jellies that passively collect the uh, food in their tentacles um, and same goes for for lobsters lobsters when they hatch out are a little bit larger than stone crab larvae um, they're very delicate um, uh, they they passively travel in the plankton they can swim a little bit but they're mostly passive travelers and um, anything that comes in contact with them that's got a mouth bigger than their body size will will chow down on them okay so let's go back to uh, Beth and or Gary Nichols. I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, this is Gary again. Hi, Aaron. Um, Hi. Just um, I'm listening to your thing. It's almost like uh, what we're going to be kind of, I'm on the opposite end of things, being a, a representative of the commercial fishing industry. And tomorrow we, we do the FWC thing. We have really, kind of combined our efforts and i think we're on the same page with these escape points and we've been kind of experimenting with them the last few years with uh dr gandy and trying to figure out what to do and we're behind that so we're basically going to have to get a million escape gaps or escape rings in our traps and i think it's about time that we do that at the same time we're talking about possibly um cutting down on our calling boxes and we're there's four proposals there it's a very, very hard fishery. I've been doing this fishery for 47 years, seeing ups and downs. We had algae blooms that were incredible after the hurricane, and we had a really, really poor season that year. This season, we were having a very, very good season, and I saw stone crabs, which I'm out on the water seven days a week, pulling 800, 1,000 traps a day, and we saw crabs all over the areas where we fished, which is mostly offshore, 20 to 50 miles, and from the Keys, about 20 miles north and up to 40 miles north. And uh, we, we had, a, it looked very encouraging that we came off the algae blooms from last year, which was really disastrous. So this year, having a pretty productive year, and then the coronavirus came, we had to bring our traps in two months early. So the effort on the crabs got reduced quite considerably just by not being able to sell. And almost all the fishery, fisheries, which is about 60% of the fisheries down here in the Keys, we brought in our traps at least two months early. Now, Hopefully going forward tomorrow, there's some pretty big decisions here with the FWC. Hopefully we can um, come up with a kind of a compromise thing. And uh, I'm, I'm glad hearing what you said, but at the same time, the size of the stone crab, if you increase it one eighth of an inch, I'm losing 20 to 25% of my medium crabs 
Now, the, where I fish 40 to 60 miles offshore in the Gulf, the amount of stone crabs that I catch that are mediums is about 70%. So the basically the loss of income to me is about 20 to 25% because unfortunately I'm catching that many mediums. Now I understand what you're saying. Right. We did a life cycle study back in the late 60s, early 70s, and came up with this two and three quarter inch size because the crabs will have three times that we able to reproduce or regrow the claw three times. If we cut back an eighth of an inch from what my understanding is, then we only actually get two reproductive claw size increments. Because the, the life cycle is what, six to, eight, eight, six to eight years, according to what you're saying. Maybe you can clarify that for me, because I'm trying to get the genetic part of if the claws grow three times. That's what kind of my biggest concern of jumping up an eighth of an inch in the claw size is. That, that's right. kind of my question, Phil. Sure. Um... So the the uh, with the change in size of the claw, you're right. I, I, I've I sit on the state stone crab advisory panel um, with Ryan Gandy, and, and we've heard from a lot of the fishermen talking about how that will most likely take a 25% hit to their annual harvest um, by doing that. Um, I think some of those studies that you might be referring to, those were showing that they, they were reproductively mature later. And I think some of the work that's more recent is showing that that we're now seeing um, the opposite trend. There's more crabs that are smaller that are becoming um, uh, reproductive earlier, um, which could be a good thing for the fishery in the sense that there'll be more, more time in the crab's life cycle to reproduce. But it also, from a biology standpoint, might be related to the fact that we've maybe removed all of the larger animals and that the, the population is shifting its, its reproduction to be uh, uh, earlier in its life cycle. So you're getting smaller crabs. So if you're taking those um, smaller crabs out of the fishery as well, you're gonna reduce that, that biomass. Um, I'm not sure about estimates on the number of times a crab would put, uh, put a claw um, back out, so re regenerating a claw, because um, I think a lot of that has to do with kind of like an energy budget, very similar to how um, you balance, balance a checkbook uh, with money coming in and money going out. You have so much food coming in, your food consumption is reduced with reduction in um, with claw removal um, and temperature as well, temperature changes as well impacts that. So um, I think that is a a whole completely different study in itself that that might have to be looked at as well. Um, but yeah, you you have very good concerns. I I, I agree um, with with some of what you're saying that um, fish and wildlife and the fishermen have to come to some type of uh, agreement in that you know you guys don't want to go out of business um, and fish and wildlife want to preserve the fishery and and you guys want to preserve the fishery as well because that's that's the future. Um, so uh, I think they have some decent. Uh, compromises on the table from, from that last stone crab meeting I attended that could be helpful to the fishery. Um, and, and you're right, so the, 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 the boxes is another, another contributing factor that they um, have, uh, that the, the advisory panel had, had listed as a potential, um, a potential for the, the fishery to implement. Um, so I hope, I'm hoping for a good meeting and that, that everybody can leave happily and, and get a little bit of what they want to preserve the fishery. Um, that's that's the important thing. Well, we've done a lot of work with with um, we try to work together, you know, within industry and so on and so sure. forth. But uh, I think that uh, I I think that going forward with this escape ring is going to be a big deal. I mean, that's something a total hasn't nothing's really happened in the fishery, and it's it's very cyclic. Even though I have twelve thousand traps, I don't normally select to put them all out at the same time. And it it our catch is based a lot on. Um, events of whether the the price the um the cost of the crab the, the pr cost of unit effort it cost me two thousand dollars to leave the dock so if i'm catching 200 pounds of crabs that's not going to work so uh, there's a lot of things the effort that we put in the crabs really doesn't show up on the statistics but even with a bad year with a, with the hurricane year after the hurricane we actually got such good prices we actually made really good money even last season with a bad season now this season was a good season and we had to stop fishing because we were over producing seven, eight dollars a pound for crab because we caught so many crabs. So being an independent fisherman, I have I have restaurants that I send crabs to. And if I'm going to get paid 
not enough money to, to pay the boats and the crew to go out and catch the, the crabs, I don't fish the crabs. So it's a lot different than the lobster fishery. And But at the same time, I think we're, we're on the right track with the escape rings. The size of the crab, I think they really kind of need to hold off on because I just don't see the point in the size. I, the medium crab is a very marketable crab. It's a less expensive for the public. And um, the crab can re regenerate the crab claws. And we are very careful that, that um, boxing and crab, we stop doing that. And I'm one of the, I mean, our, our family hasn't uh, broke. I haven't had more than a box of crabs on my boat in the last 25 years. We stopped, we, we stopped doing the boxing of crabs. So now they're going to two boxes. There, there's, it's just laziness and, and people that don't want to, you know, take the time to stop the boat and go back and, and measure your crabs and, and call them out or you're not training your crewmen right. And that's the only reason why you would have more than, than two boxes of crabs on the boat. So that's a good thing. And I know that, you know, I think we're on the right page. Shortening the season is gonna to be tough on the people up north and maybe a couple of weeks would be max. I mean, we can't really go too much off because we're coming off lobster season ends the end of March. And then we have really bad weather during that, that uh, late winter time, early spring. And we have to have time to get in the traps income off the lobster season plus if you go up north florida they have the cold weather and they're not able right. to make a living with crabs because they got to wait till the crabs the water warms up so the crabs start migrating again and they can make a little bit of money so i think it's real critical the amount of time that they take off so you don't kill those those guys trying to make the end of the season run where we're able to fish all year those guys don't get that anyway i don't want to take up your time because we get a lot of other questions well, thank, you. thank you for sharing your perspective thank you. Gary. appreciate it I do see Mary Lou Rubin has a hand raised, so I want to make sure we get in this last question. Um, Mary Lou, your microphone has been unmuted. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Um, really enjoyed Hi, Alan. Your talk. Hi. <laughs> I really enjoyed your talk. My, Thank you. My, my question is, is kind of basic, too. What kills the crab, and why do the larger crabs die? more frequently after their harvest. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that question. So uh, the um, with my studies, the, the, the things that might be going on with the reduction in pH um, could be related to some type of physiological mechanism. Um, so there's been some evidence for crustaceans in general that suggests uh, that they, they have difficulty controlling their acid-base balance um, internally when they are in um, reduced pH seawater. Um, so that might be what's going on with the larvae and um, the juveniles that, that I was talking about. As far as the, the larger crabs and why they die more often after declawing, um, I'm not sure of a stat that shows that, but um, it, my guess would be that, that they're they're older, they're closer to the end of their life cycle. If you if you if you're talking about those large and jumbo crab claws, um, and uh, they just don't have time in their life, if they're six or eight years old already, to regenerate a claw to come back into the fishery, just because they're they're already at their end of their life expectancy. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. All right, thank you so much. I don't see any others at the moment, so just a couple more notes before we sign off for the evening. Um, I would not be a good membership and events manager here if I did not remind you all that our spring membership drive is ongoing. We appreciate everyone who has chosen to join, reactivate, upgrade, or refer since the launch of our drive on March 1st. While the membership drive continues, we are sensitive to the uncertainty facing both our local economy and personal household finances. With that in mind, we have extended the timeframe of the membership drive through June 20th, and we will reschedule a later date the drawing for our amazing Key West excursion. This lecture has been recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel and we will be sharing it to our Facebook page as well. At the conclusion of our program, you all will be prompted to take a brief survey about your experience with tonight's lecture. We value your feedback and would love for you to take a moment and complete the survey. The survey will also be sent in a follow-up email in case you'd like to complete it at a later time. As Jill mentioned at the start, we have a new lecture scheduled in June. If you are on our email list, you will receive an email with the registration link for that June 10th lecture on the Monday before. 
The registration link is also currently available on our keysdiscovery.com website and our Facebook page. I hope you all have a great evening and don't forget to tune in to tomorrow's virtual visit with our curator, Brad Bertelli, via Facebook Live at 10 a.m. and our field trip this Friday, also at 10 a.m. via Facebook. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great evening.